Good morning, and welcome to another edition of United Way for Southeastern Michigan's What's the Word Wednesday, where we share important discussions and resources about topics that matter to you. My name is Audrey Walker, and today we are continuing our Equity Challenge series of What's the Word Wednesday town halls by discussing the current and future landscape of doula care within prison systems with the Michigan Prison Doula Initiative. And a few reminders for today's discussion, we hope to have time for a few questions from our audience today. So please put your questions um, in the chat box on Zoom or in the comment section if you're watching on Facebook. Um, closed captions are enabled on Zoom and Facebook Live. To turn them on, please click, click on the show captions button um, at the bottom of your screen. As you may already know, United Way launched our fourth annual 21 Day Equity Challenge series three weeks ago. And as we embarked on new equity focused content with thousands of our friends here in Metro Detroit and across the nation. For a variety of reasons, being incarcerated can be a frightening physical and mental experience. One of the often overlooked factors that cause this experience is birth and pregnancy. Many prisons and jails lack the policies and practices needed to adequately address the pregnancy and postpartum needs of incarcerated women. In an already unsettling environment, pregnant individuals often face emotional trauma, limited social support, and separation from their newborn baby up to two days after giving birth. Today, we are joined by two amazing women from the Michigan Prison Doula Initiative, who will guide us through current practices and future possibilities of maternal care in prisons. And I'm pleased to introduce you to our speakers for today. We have Tata Hughes, who is the Executive Director of the Michigan Doula, uh, Prison Doula Initiative. And Tata uh, joined the MPDI team uh, two years ago with a background in equity and public service. Um, she earned a Juris Doctorate from Michigan State University and uses legal scholarship to encourage progress in various communities, including child maternal health, housing, and the arts. And we also have Kara Genicio, um, the Executive Director of Michigan Prison Doula Initiative, um, also one of the co-founders of the organization um, who is joining us. She's been a Lamaze Certified Birth Educator since 2008 and has been a birth doula since 2009. Kara is also the MPDI Program Director and Child Birth Educator inside the Women's Huron Valley Correctional Facility, where she coordinates the birth doula support program and childbirth education for MPDI's incarcerated clients. So welcome, Teta and Kara, and thank you for being here with us today and sharing more about the Michigan Prison Doula Initiative. Thank you so much for having us. We are excited to present about um, birth equity in the context of prisons in Michigan. Uh, my name is Teta Hughes, as you introduced us very, very well. I will pass it off to Kara. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for welcoming us here. Um, I'm going to just start talking a little bit about the uh, founding of the Michigan Prison Doula Initiative, the history of how we got started. Um, so if you could jump over to the next slide. Um, I am one of uh, the four co-founders of MPDI. Um, the organization was founded as a 501c3 in 2018. Um, and we offer client-centered trauma-informed doula support for people birthing uh, while they're serving a sentence at the uh, one women's prison in the state, which is in the Ypsilanti area. Um, just a quick note about language. Um, I tend to, when I'm speaking, use um, non-binary language um, to kind of welcome everybody into this birth space. But in the case of what we're working on now, um, you know, the prison itself is called the women's prison and a lot of the research and data says mothers and women. So you likely hear some of that language, but I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, I personally am a birth doula and a childbirth educator. I'm also the, the program director. Um, and I personally have been providing um, childbirth education inside um, the women's prison um, since fall of 2011, um, when the, the Michigan Department of Corrections reached out to seek childbirth education um, inside the prison. Um, and very soon after I started, um, I began hearing two primary 
worries and fears um, amongst the, the participants in class. Um, I would hear a lot of concern and fear and worry about the separation from the newborn baby, usually at about two to three days after the birth, when the mother returns to the prison and the baby goes to whomever um, the care provider is going to be. Um, so that was concern and fear number one. Uh, concern and fear number two was about giving birth without support. Now, to be clear, there is medical care for sure, um, but in terms of labor support, a family member, you know, somebody who is provide labor support, um, that was not available, that wasn't there. Um, and so as a birth doula, very quickly, um, I, I recognized that I could try to do something about one of those two things, uh, about one of those two fears. Um, I couldn't impact um, the separation from baby, um, but in terms of labor support, that I could try to do. Um, and so I started, along with the other co-founders, um, started talking to kind of as many people as possible um, within MDOC, within the hospital, um, about the possibility for offering doula care. Um, and so with a focus on, on birth equity, um, I just want to turn to that definition. Um, the National Birth Equity Collaborative um, offers this definition of birth equity the assurance of the conditions of optimal birth for all people with a willingness to address racial and social inequities in a sustained effort. Um, and there's a couple of aspects of that definition that I just wanna pull out in terms of doula care itself. Um, optimal birth, you know, often we think about optimal birth in terms of health outcomes, um, you know, baby weight or week of birth, prematurity, um, complications, things like that. But as a doula, um, often our focus is in a, in a different area. Um, it is on the fact that for each individual person having a baby, their own definition of what an optimal birth is for them changes from the person next to them. Um, we don't all have the same definition of what an optimal birth is for me. That changes person to person, it's very individual. Um, so with regards to like pain medication or the type of support around me, um, who's in the room? Um, am I moving around a lot? Um, you know, those types of questions about kind of what birth experience I want is a part of optimal birth and it is highly individualized. And that's the area where doulas focus. Um, and then the other piece of this, um, this definition of birth equity that I want to focus on is the sustained effort. Um, and I'm going to get into this momentarily when I talk about doula care and what it is, um, but the sustained nature of it, that it is continuous support one-on-one -on -one, um, from one professional doula to somebody giving birth in a sustained way throughout their pregnancy and into the postpartum period. Um, doula care is inherently sustained and continuous. And so it is, and in our case, the case of our program, it's one client at a time. Every single client who wants a doula, that sustained effort of caring for that person, providing support to that person throughout the perinatal period and into the postpartum period, um, that's kind of built into doula care. Um, and I'll go in a little bit uh, into what a doula is. Um, I don't have to define this word as much as I used to when I started as a doula in 2008, but a brief overview. Um, we are non-medical professional support for birth. Um, that's a thing, something that distinguishes doulas from uh, medical care providers. Um, we're not doctors. We don't have uh, medical training. We're not midwives or nurses. All of those individuals have medical training. Doulas do not. Um, and so what that means in the birth setting is, you know, I don't have to think about charting. Um, I don't have to think about maternal blood pressure. I don't need to think about contraction patterns. Um, those types of medical things are not in my scope of practice. Um, birth doula care is um, an overarching um, support throughout the period of pregnancy and postpartum in terms of informational, um, emotional, and in during the labor, physical support 
Um, that starts with prenatal visits for kind of visioning what your optimal birth is. What does that mean to you? Um, and in our case, in the case of the prison doula initiative, those visits take place in the housing unit at the prison. Um, Hands-on labor support at the birthing hospital. So the doula comes to the hospital during the birth experience and provides um, you know, physical support with massage techniques and position changes, um, emotional support um, in terms of the, the, the intensity and the challenge of labor, um, and also informational support of thinking about, you know, what questions might you have? And do you have anything you need to ask the medical team? Or is this type of thing kind of normal? And, you know, the, what am I experiencing right now? Is this a typical experience for labor? That type of informational support doulas offer that in the moment as well. And this continues into the postpartum follow-up um, back again at the housing unit, at the prison um, for follow-up after the birth. And um, a lot of that follow-up is um, emotional support um, after the separation from baby. Um, so that is kind of the scope of the doula role and how it plays in in different places depending upon where our client is at the time. Um, and then we're, we're going to look a little bit at like how do doulas factor into this overarching question of birth equity. Um, we, I, I wanted to highlight one study for you to provide an example. Um, so this is one study, these quotes come from one study of, um, uh, and the variable here was doula care. Um, all of the birthing people in this study had childbirth education. Some had a doula, some did not. So that was the variable. Um, and in this study, um, doula assisted mothers were four times less likely to have a low birth weight baby, two times less likely to have a complication for them or the baby, and significantly more likely to initiate breastfeeding not long after birth. And so the variable being doula care, we saw some differences in these health outcomes um, for somebody who had a doula versus somebody who did not. And I often get the question of like, okay, if doulas aren't medical providers and we're not making a diagnosis, we're not recommending a treatment, you know, we don't have any medical procedures that we are able to do, it's out of our scope, how do we impact health outcomes? Um, and this study, um, and I, I bolded the text for you, um, put forth the idea that having a doula kind of traveling by your side throughout the perinatal, the perinatal period and, and having somebody there who emphasizes your centrality in the birth experience, um, the importance of your voice, the importance of your wishes and your preferences, the power of your parenting and how you can care for the baby during pregnancy, during labor, um, and stay connected to the baby in the postpartum period, having somebody there continuously who is validating that um, increases um, the, the self-efficacy of the parent to say, my wishes are important. My values matter. Um, if something feels not right to me, I'm going to speak up about it because I know how to care for myself and I know how to care for my baby. The presence of the doula emphasizing these things um, throughout the period of pregnancy and postpartum is one theory about how a non-medical person intervenes um, in, and increases the likelihood of good outcomes. Um, and this is something I really wanna focus on in terms of um, this particular study and equity. Um, the study's participants, um, their identities and circumstances put them, put them into uh, several categories where in the United States, they would have a higher chance of adverse birth outcomes, racial disparity, uh, housing insecurity, history of violence in their lives, um, poverty, et cetera. Um, all of those disparities um, are true of our population of clients um, who are incarcerated. Um, and one, one in particular that, that I cite um, nationally, um, there is an indication that something like 85 to 90% of incarcerated women have a history in their lives of either sexual or um, violent as a part of their life history, 85 to 90%. Um, and so our clients have these um, 
uh, adverse risk increases <laughs> in terms of likelihood. Um, but dualist support um, seems to be an intervention that instead raises the chances of positive birth outcomes and addresses these disparities directly. Um, and so that's kind of the role of the doula in the picture here of birth equity overall. And um, now it's time for Teta to turn to the bigger picture. Thank you, Kara. That was really, really great. Um, I guess uh, to put that into the bigger picture of the United States, uh, it's interesting to be discussing birth equity today. And then uh, the part that really always sticks out to me is that optimal part of equity. That is actually what we're asking for is for good outcomes or ideal outcomes or as close to that as we can get. And unfortunately, the outcomes outside of incarceration are actually pretty dismal in the United States when it comes to the birthing population uh, uh, and pregnancy outcomes. So even though we spend the most of, of uh, first world nations on uh, maternal uh, care and healthcare, we have really, really historically terrible outcomes related to um, preterm birth, uh, 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 all sorts of gestational issues, and then also the birth outcome itself uh, as far as live birth, mother's condition, all of those things. So interestingly, the odds of a positive or optimal outcome if you are incarcerated, even in situations where uh, the conditions are not ideal, seem to trend towards better than if you weren't incarcerated at all, which is fairly odd, but that's where we are. So researchers hypothesize that it's uh, the regular care and limited uh, access to harmful substances in prison that boost the outcomes. And I think that that generally has to be true since not every state has a um, doula program for prisoners. So uh, next slide, please. So how do you achieve birth equity in the United States? And then also that leads to how did we create the doula program here? Um, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology created standards. Anytime you wanna create um, optimal outcomes, you need to have standards or some sort of list of criteria to follow. And once you've created those standards, you need to implement them with fidelity. And so that kind of erases some of the inequity that you would experience if you don't implement them with fidelity because of stigma or any other sort of historical disenfranchisement. Um, those uh, include for uh, perinatal care in a correctional setting, consistent pregnancy testing, access to pregnancy counseling and abortion services, access and treatment for substance abuse, HIV and depression, which is obviously very key, appropriate vitamins and diet, uh, delivery in a licensed hospital uh, with facilities for high-risk pregnancy and then postpartum contracept contraception. So um, MPDI, uh, and thank you to Women's Huron Valley Prison, support those uh, standards. And we move beyond the standards because we do have a relationship with MDOC in a contract, thank you to Kara, that allows us to implement our programming that go far beyond that. So data is scarce. So this was the hard part. I always love to do the data part. I'm the, the uh, statistics person because I went to law school and you want to prove everything that you say. And so uh, prior to MPDI's uh, creation, Michigan had a great F. And that's not necessarily because of our uh, treatment of pregnant prisoners. It's mostly because we didn't have um, organized programming that we could discuss. And we also did not, we're not very transparent about what happens in our prisons. And so since the inception of MPDI, the service pr provision has obviously meet, met the standards set by uh, the College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and moved beyond that. So the really, really great news that's happened since uh, MPDI's inception was the policy directive passage uh, in November 2021, 0404155. And that cemented uh, the client's access to certain rights within the Department of Corrections if they were pregnant. And that includes creating a birth plan, having a support person, which is so incredibly key, 
limitations to physical constraints, body milk expression support, and the newborn visitation and doula support access. So doula support access doesn't mean you get an MPDI doula. Doula support access means you get the choice of having an MPDI doula. And we're very fortunate that because of everything that's happening in the prison and everything that is happening with the program, clients do want to participate with MPDI and they do regularly. I don't, I, I, I don't know what the percentage is. I think it was 99%. Uh, Kara said a uh, meeting or two ago. So we we have great participation. And again, the care is uh, client-centered and trauma-informed. And so the results of having MPDI in prisons in Michigan uh, inevitably leads to lower recidivism. And when I say recidivism, I mean people do not return to prison after they are released, uh, typically based on, I think, this is totally just me speaking, compassionate care. I really do think that that is the difference. Um, and so what MPDI does, in addition to everything that happens in the birthing hospital and in the prison, is that we care for our doulas. So if we're going to be client-centered, we have to make sure that our doulas are following best practices and are up to date on any sort of uh, professional development opportunities or trainings. And so we offer that free of charge to our doulas pretty much annually. We have the best board in the world. And so um, I write the grants, they say yes, and then we create opportunities. And one of those opportunities, we have to thank United Way of Southeast Michigan for, uh, which I'm very excited about. Um, uh, we got a self-care grant for doulas. And so we were finally able to take care of the people who take care of everyone else, which is just the coolest opportunity ever. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so like I said, we are client-centered and trauma-informed, but the most important thing I think that helps MPDI be what it is, is that we are financially distinct from the state. We do not receive any funding from the state. And so we depend on grants and donors. Uh, but what that means is we can keep the client as the center of every decision that we make, and that is what we do. But if you get state funding, your obligations can shift and change. And as much as we have gotten so lucky with the prison and the birthing hospital and everyone else around us, because again, we did not uh, really contribute much to the passage of the policy directive 040155, we do want to focus on what we do best, and that is provide the best doula care humanly possible in a setting that is very, very supportive of us. So thank you. That's awesome. And I totally appreciate your passion. You can tell both um, Ted and Kara when you're um, talking about the work that you do and why it's so important and the outcomes, um, especially when you're talking about that compassionate care and just how important it is for all of us to take care of each other, you know, no matter what the situation or especially in situations that can be you know, um, born out of trauma and, um, you know, frightening experiences. So we really appreciate you sharing more about what the Michigan Prison Doula Initiative um, is doing in our community. And we do have a few um, questions. I know you had mentioned uh, the policy directive um, for change, but I was just curious, are there any policy changes related to birth equity that you're currently working on or that you would like to see? Um, I this is Kara. I don't know if I'm on screen, but I'm happy to answer that. Um, one one thing I do want to um, acknowledge, and this doesn't directly impact um, our clients, but it does impact the state as a whole. Um, the the fact that now doula care can be covered by Medicaid um, was a and this was January 2023 that this changed in the state of Michigan. Um, that is a an extremely important change with, with an eye on birth equity and availability and accessibility of doula care. Um, I just want to highlight that and mm -hmm. really focus on that um, as something that would, would address um, the crucial role of the doula and making sure that doulas are truly available to anybody um, who wants one. Um, and so that that fact of, of Medicaid coverage for doula care is a really, really crucial uh, moment for the mm -hmm. state of Michigan. That's great. Yeah. Um, and then in your experience with this work, what is something people often don't understand about incarcerated 
um, pregnant or just incarcerated individuals that you'd like to share with us? I guess from um, my perspective. Oh, yeah. sorry. No, no, go ahead, Teta, please. Yeah. We talked about this yesterday because that was question yeah. number two. Um, <laughs> and we, I think we should both answer actually because we have slightly different takes on it. For me, I think the thing that people forget about is the separation. I don't think anyone, when they think of it, they go, oh, someone did something. And so they're in prison and they happen to be pregnant. And, and it's tragic and sad, but I don't think that they understand that what is about to happen to this pregnant person is pretty much in my mind, the worst thing that can happen to a person. And that is the separation from their baby right after birth. I, it, I can't imagine anything worse. And so yeah. I think that people should focus on that. And I think that that will drive more humanity, more compassion in all of the contexts. And when it comes to policy, I think there was a question about court and policy. We try to stay completely out of that area because it's riddled with um, complexities and, and rent seeking and all sorts of things that have nothing to do with what we do. We, the client is the center of what we do, not mm -hmm. a court, not laws, not anything else. And so we are very fortunate that there are justice organizations and individuals and all sorts of activist groups and plans to support what we do, but we, that's not where we are, are, are active. We are active in the prison. We are active in the hospital. We're active behind a computer screen. What do you think, Kara? I, I think that's a great answer and I, I you okay. got it. <laughs> Um, we have time, I think, just for one more question. I know there was some questions around, you know, what is the training process like for a doula on your team? And then is there any other specific requirements for being a prison doula? That's a great question. Um, yeah, so we require the doulas to have gone through training from some sort of organized uh, doula training organization. There are many. Um, and so any number of those organizations are are totally valid for the doula training background. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge that our doula team has some additional kind of bureaucratic um, uh, hoops to jump through, let's put it that way, um, background checks, um, liability insurance requirements, um, have repeated um, renewals of volunteer approval within the Department of Corrections um, and also at the birthing hospital. Um, and we do say birthing hospital because um, we are asked to not identify which hospital, um, but um, it is, uh, there's requirements from hospital, from the prison, and then also internally. Um, and so these would all be kind of administrative um, expectations of the doulas on our team that other doulas don't necessarily have to navigate. Um, okay. And so, you know, that's a moment for me to acknowledge um, what our doulas do to stay on our team. Um, they are the heart of the team and they do have to go through some additional training, trauma-informed training and things like that to remain on our doula team. We have seven active doulas on the team and they all, um, take this process very, very seriously. It's right at their heart. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for that. And I wish we had more time to go through many more questions. I know this is a topic that everyone was interested in learning more about. So really appreciate you sharing uh, your information and, and stories. And we have shared in the chat different links that people can get connected to you um, and um, and learn more about, you know, how we can support you and in your initiatives as well. So we, we do really appreciate that. Um, and before we close, I just have a couple more updates uh, for our audience here. Um, just as a reminder for anyone in our community who may be experiencing a need, our 211 helpline remains available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and includes re uh, connecting you to resources like food, utility assistance, and much, much more. And we maintain a running list of available resources uh, for services in our community and can connect you to the support that you need. And you can also look up those resources in your area by using our 211 uh, resource database at unitedwaysem.org slash 211. Um, as we mentioned earlier in this town hall, we are in the midst of the equity challenge, our fourth annual equity challenge, and we'd love for you to be able to join us. So you can still sign up for this year's 21 day equity challenge at unitedwaysem.org slash equity challenge. 
And our next town hall will continue our, our equity challenge series uh, with a Pride Month town hall as we learn more about LGBTQIA plus health and wellness and how to navigate social norms and healthcare. We will be joined by Cal's Cousins from Cal's Liberatory Creations and Consulting. Um, to stay updated on any upcoming topics and watch replays of our previous town halls, please visit unitedwaysem.org slash virtual town halls. Uh, we appreciate everyone joining us today. We hope you stay cool out there and please continue to live united. Thank you so much.